Hey everybody, Rich Folley. You are back at AWP 2019. You're watching PBS Books coverage of this amazing event. So much energy in this building. So many writers, so many people who love writing all in one place. And we love that. And we're sitting now with Lilium Rivera, who's the author of a brand new young adult novel called Dealing in Dreams. So nice to have you, first of all. Thank you, thank you for having me. Oh, and what a cover. I know, isn't Come it gorgeous? I love gorgeous. it so much. It's yeah. beautiful, I would frame it and put it in my house. Yeah. <laughs> yes, you're also the author of The Education of Margot Sanchez. You're, Brook, or you're Bronx born and bred. Yes. Living in Los Angeles now though. Yes. But let's talk about this book. It's sort of this fantastical world. Uh, Anala is the main character. Mm -hmm. She's in an all-girl crew. It's this mm -hmm. gang sort of story in Mega City. Mm -hmm. Tell me like where the story of Mega City comes from. Where did the idea of Mega City come from? Well, I mean, I definitely wanted to create this like near future world. Um, and it's, you know, it's set very close by you. It seems familiar. And if, if you're from the Bronx, you would know the setting is the Bronx. But only a person from the Bronx would catch the little Easter eggs that I placed in there. And I just really wanted to to write a sort of uh, gender flip of these books that I read when I was growing up. The Outsiders, A Clockwork Orange, um, I watched Mad Max Fury Road, all these kind of like all girl violence incorporating. What does that world look like in the future with a 16 year old girl leading this all girl gang crew and they're all Latinas. Yeah. So I wanted to like kind of write about that. Yeah, she's tough mm -hmm. and there is violence and it is like a rough world and yet she is an incredibly powerful character. And so when you're envisioning Nala, first of all, finding that super strength, that person mm -hmm. that can like not only lead this group, but has the power and strength to sort of find her way through the city to the, the and do the things she needs to do. I don't want to mm -hmm. give any spoilers away right. in the book. <laughs> it's such a tough story though to read because this is a character that has to make some really tough decisions. I mean, it's, I feel like it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a story that a lot of young people, especially young people of color, have to go through. They, they have to navigate a lot of unwelcoming spaces. And I really wanted to like, delve into that kind of world where maybe violence was her path, was the one path that she felt would be her salvation. And really question, what does that look like? What does the American dream look like in the future? Uh, what does home look like? And so with Nala, I was able to explore all that. I mean, she's tough, and the decisions she makes are really uh, sometimes flawed, but I understand them completely. You said in the, in the I think the acknowledgments, you, you um, basically dedicate the book to everyone who wonders where they stand in the world, and you talk about hoping that they find their buffalo stance. Can you explain <laughs> that? Uh, yes. that? That person that you're writing the book to, and whether or not she comes from your own personal life, and then the, the idea of the buffalo stance. So buffalo stance is, it's a dedicated from a song in the 1980s from Nina Cherry, and it's- um, I love Nina and it's, Cherry. Right, it's like if you know the song, you know exactly what I'm talking about, and it's a song that when I was growing up, that was the song that I loved, and I, it was like an empowerment, like calling, you know? And um, I've wanted to, for young people, because it's such, they're, oh, this is a moment when they're discovering their first, the first time they fall in love, the first time they, you know, they discover shame, all these things that are like a discovery of first. I also want them to like, it's a discovery of what it means to take a stand. You know, it's really that moment of empowerment. Yeah. And that's really what I was trying to explore with Nala. And I, I dedicate it to everyone, because no one has an answer, not the adults in this, you know, not now, and not in the adults in this, in my book as well. So it's really just trying to discover the path that you need to, that seems right for your, for your life, for mm. Nala, for her people. Right. So yeah. For, for that group that you're writing towards, against the backdrop of, United States circa 2019, this seems so relevant right mm -hmm. now, finding your place in the world, finding a, a, a country that loves you back, yeah. uh, finding uh, the, a, a, a group of people that you can trust, mm -hmm. that you know has your back. It seems like so pr relevant. You're talking to these people all the time now yes. as, a, as a writer of young adult fiction. What are you seeing in terms of what the, the messages they're gravitating to, especially mm. right now? This is a great thing. I, I, I'm lucky enough that I get to travel all over the U.S. to, school, to do school visits. I, you know, I visit high school, middle grade students, and we talk about everything. We talk about addiction, gentrification, um, violence, um, domestic violence, all things, all, you know, all topics. And the one thing that I've always found that uni uni unifies all of these kids is that they're not afraid to express themselves. Yeah. There, there are no questions for them. They're like gender. Is that new? No, like I don't, I don't know. Like for me, I feel like 
uh, the adults are having the problem right. <laughs> with you know exactly. oh ex being accepting of all genders. They they're accepting of all of it. You know they're just like Latinx. Yes, let's talk about Latinx. Let's use a more ex inclusive kind of term for us. Um, and they're more than open about it. And this is from all ages, like all 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 types of like you know poor or rich kids, it doesn't matter. Like I felt they're way more um, open about things than most of the adults in my life. Yeah, I think <laughs> that I, I see the same thing outside of the, Latin, the Latinx group too. I mean, my, my own kids are more advanced than I was at my age. They seem smarter than me at that age. I felt like I was living in a bubble yeah. and didn't understand a lot that they seem to just take for granted. In fact, criticize me sometimes for maybe not being as progressive or as thoughtful as I need to be. I mean, I just feel like if we go back and we look at like history and who leads kind of like all these, you know, like Chicano, you know, in the 1970s, who was leading those school, the school walkouts, they were all the young kids, the young high school kids. So I, it's, it is a cyclical thing. So it makes sense. You know, if you really pay attention, it makes sense that the kids are leading, are the forefront of change, mm -hmm. you know. So the idea of, of navigating a hard world, mm. which is where I think Nala's story is, mm. I mean, really physically, literally navigating a tough world, you know, figuring out how to cross the city and get to places and figuring out how to take on these other crews that are coming into her life. That's obviously uh, an allegory for a much larger story for you, too. But that idea of navigating, was it? Tell me about your own life growing mm. up in the Bronx, and, and was it as challenging as the one that we're hearing about from now, or were there pieces of that? Yes, I mean, I, you know, I didn't grow up in violence or anything, but I grew up in the in the projects. I grew up in the housing projects, um, 183rd, and I grew up right during the crack epidemic and um, and th during the rise of hip hop and all those things and. I think for me, because I was coming from the Bronx, a lot of people outside of the Bronx were like, oh, you're from the Bronx? So I, I came, I would come into a room with like the defensive, like on the defensive of, yeah, I'm from the Bronx, what? You right. know? And so it was because no one was really visiting the Bronx. You would go to the Bronx Yankees Zoo, you or, would go yeah. to the game, yeah. right? Yankee, Yankee Stadium, and then that would be it. But people weren't aware that there's creativity, there's love, people are falling in love, people are making amazing art, you know, all these wonderful, beautiful things happening there um, that people overlook. And now all of a sudden it's, you know, it's the renaissance of the Bronx or something. Right. I'm like, we've been here, we've been creating all these wonderful things. It's yeah. just now people are able to see it more. Maybe Twitter, maybe, you know, the social media aspect of it. but. It's interesting for me. Like I'm, I'm really happy that I'm like, I'm in this conversation of even having like talking about the Bronx. You know, I'm really, I'm forever talking about the Bronx. So you can't <laughs> take the Bronx out of the girl. You're in Los Angeles now, but there's so much Bronx in you right now. It's like literally floating. So what's it like being a Bronx girl in LA though? It's a totally different town. It but is. Obviously, you love it. You're there. Yes. Tell me about that sort of juxtaposition between the two coasts. Um, yeah. I, because I grew up watching TV from the Bronx, I like living in a in an LA because it's it is a movie magical city. Like I like that people are making movies or making television, filming outside my house. You know, to me that's wonderful. It's like I grew up watching all these things. You know, so I love it. But you know, I have my attitude. My Bronx attitude comes with me everywhere. <laughs> um, I wear BX shirts all the time. <laughs> so I mean, I. You know, I go in, I have, I love the calmness of LA in some ways. I love being able to be close to the water. Um, but I go back to New York all the time. I was just there uh, a couple of days ago. Yeah. <laughs> it, is, it is an amazing city for sure. I, I like, I feed off of it too to this yeah. day. Um, back to the idea of the young adult audience, mm -hmm. one that I think that you've found energy from mm -hmm. um, because they're so open, accepting, wanting, they're hungry, they're, yeah. they're, they'll tell you exactly what they think. Mm -hmm. They're fearless in so many ways we talked about. How has that audience affected your own writing? You have to keep up with them to some degree because <laughs> they're going to always push you to talk about more, yes. obviously. Well, if I, I have to be where the kids are. Like, I love doing school visits even though I've, I've spoken to adults, like hundreds of adults, academics, educators, and, and I could do that. I could do a presentation and I have no problem. But when I have to do a present in front of kids, I'm way more nervous because they really? will call you out. Because the authenticity thing. Yes, You've like I be real. have to be real. Yeah. And so they, they, they'll they know right away and they don't care. They like don't they'll, care. Tell they'll tell you. They'll tell you to your face. <laughs>
<laughs> Oftentimes in a critical way. Yes, so, yeah. but there's there'll, there's been moments when I'm doing a presentation for kids, like a whole, like 150 kids, and I'm like, there's one kid who's looking at me, and I swear he hates everything I'm saying. He knows I'm a fraud. Yeah. And, and then he'll <laughs> he's come up. He's at yes, your soul. Yes, he's just like, I know he hates me. And then he'll come up to me. He's like, that was cool. You know, like it never <laughs> fails. Like I'm, I, I'm definitely doing, if I'm honest and true, I'm definitely doing the thing I'm supposed to do. I'm saying the things I'm supposed to say. It's one of the most discerning audiences of all. I mean, literally, there's a, like, you really have to be honest. There's some people I know that have dipped into the young adult world thinking mm. they're adult writers and they're like, oh, there's like a market there. And oh, they yeah. think about it in terms of uh, leveraging the marketplace and maybe writing a, a book for kids because right. it, they're buying the kind of stuff and they, they're going to, dumb it down or think about it or something, you know, like, they, and they dip into it and it does not fly. It doesn't work. It does they not know. work. They know. Yeah. They're, too, they're too advanced. And also, uh, kids our age are going through so many things. They're not just going through one problem, like an after school special. Right. They're dealing with all types of huge yeah. things. And so, that's what I'm writing. I'm like, I, I might be writing about a futuristic world with girl gangs, but I'm also writing about what does gentrification look like in the future? What does addiction or government imposed, uh, government imposed drug pro programs, what does that look like in the future? So I'm like, we're talking about these bigger themes and they're, they're hungry for that. Yeah. You know? One of the things about that, I, when I think about the future and the, and the way you write about it, is I'm always hoping the future is gonna turn brighter and that we're gonna like maybe turn a corner, but so yeah. often the future mm. stories that we read are these dystopian kind of presentations of like a world still broken, right? still facing the same kind of prejudices, right. facing the same kind of issues. Right. In fact, sometimes even amplified. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that, on one hand, it's fascinating to read. I think there's a drawing to like that sort of thing. On the other hand, I'm like, please, can we not just, maybe we'll be happy, <laughs> there'll be roses and sunshine, perhaps. Maybe right. we'll start to evolve as human beings. Because the one thing you talk about with the kids is that they are seem to be more okay with everyone else. They seem mm. to be more accepting and open. I right. wonder what will happen when that generation does grow up and become Do in we charge. fall into this trap that's like we're, we're supposed to be in these roles, right? right? I love writing about the roles that we're meant to take. Like even Nala, she has grown up believing that violence is her only path, her only gateway to like, you know, to the towers, to salvation. Um, I don't know, like I feel like, I try to write something more hopeful and it didn't feel real to me. But I do, there's. It's I, the characters that are hopeful though. The it's characters the, are it's hopeful. It's the spirit and the, and the emotion of these people that. And there's, that, there's the path, right? Are you gonna take this path that we all know so well? We've been through it, it's a cycle. Or are we gonna stop that cycle and go try something new and different? What does that look like? What does the future look like? So I'm hoping that's, that's what I'm writing about. Yeah, well that's <laughs> the way I feel. I feel it's super exciting. I feel like the, the, the world, your world building is amazing. I feel like I was there. I could Good. feel the Bronx in there, certainly. I don't know if I caught all the Easter eggs, but I definitely am <laughs> gonna go re reread and see if I can be smart <laughs> enough. I, I bet you they're over my head. <laughs> uh, but I'm, I'm so excited for all the things that are, that are happening to your career right now. Thank you. And I'm the fact that there's a connection being made to a really important reading audience and that you are like leading that charge oh, is really wonderful. Oh, thank you. I'm really excited to just be in the conversation. I feel there's a lot of young Latino, Latinx voices that haven't been published yet and it's just, I'm just one in the slot of many that I feel should be populating all the bookstores. Yeah, and yeah. That, that, you're, that you're getting the kids excited and you're going to the school and they're not kids. These are adults in many cases, these are people who are uh, running families in some cases. My yes. God, there's so much pressure on these people at younger and younger ages. Yeah. So the fact that you're giving them uh, a reason to read every day is really inspiring to me too. Thank you so yeah. much. I really appreciate that. Yeah, thanks so much, <laughs> Lillian, Lillian Rivera. <laughs> the book is Dealing in Dreams. Lillian Rivera, it is so cool to have you here. Thanks so much. Thank you, thank you. All right, <laughs> folks, there's still more to come. You're watching PBS Books coverage of AWP 2019. So please stick around.